we are live and i want to welcome everybody back to my on the shoulders of giants channel your home for black history i'm your historical homeboy joseph ward right here on 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 my own shows of giants youtube channel and today i got a good one for you today we're gonna dive into the history of black theater i have a great guest today we're gonna talk um uh, we're gonna learn about the Carmel House. We're gonna learn about different or new people or new names. I know for myself, new names within the realm of Black theater. We're gonna learn about um, just a lot of a lot of different new things at, when it as as when it pertains to Black theater. That's what we're gonna learn about today. I know I'm excited. I will admit, yes, I am a historian, but the realm of theater and especially Black theater. That's not my expertise. Um, growing up in Tallahassee, Florida, theater was not something that we were introduced to as much as like sports or things like that. So occasionally we would get taken to plays occasionally. Um, and usually they would take us to plays that we didn't want to go to. So you got a young <laughs> bunch of young black kids from the inner city and you're taking us to see the Nutcracker. We don't want to see that. Um, and when they did take us to see Black theater, it wasn't explained. So we didn't re necessarily gravitate to it the way we did sports uh, or other entertainment outlets, right? So I'm excited because like I said, we get to dive deeper. This is part two of the history of Black theater and I, I want to take a different direction with this one. So, um, but before I before I get into why I want to take it into a different direction, real quick, some housekeeping. Uh, make sure you visit my website, www.ontheshoulders1.com to learn more about myself, Joseph Ward, and learn more about my platform, On the Shoulders of Giants, where we tell the stories of the sung and unsung heroes of the African diaspora, our stories from our perspective at your fingertips. All right. Make sure you support me on Patreon <coughs> at patreon.com backslash OTSOG. You can um, download my app off of my website. Um, that way you can see all of my quizzes and all of the uh, the way the different ways I use the information that I find. You can also get my books. I have three volumes out on the Souls of Giants, volumes one, two, and three. You can get those off of my website. Volume one is covering North America. Volume two is Central America. Volume three is South America. Uh, you can check out my online course. You can get you one of these shirts. I got these shirts going. So you can get you a shirt, uh, mask, all those things we got going on with on the shows of giants. But for the most part, go get the information. It's a whole bunch of information, over 200, maybe 300 stories of our heroes of our African diaspora. So go check it out. All right. So enough <laughs> about me. All right. So part one of, uh, the history of black theater, I had seven, uh, summer Hill seven, Mr. Lowell Williams and Baba Ola Sagan Williams on. And we were, we had, a, you know, when we get together, we have great discussions, right? So we're having a great lively discussion. And in the comments, there was this, 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 this lady in the comments who knew just as much about the subjects that the gentlemen were talking about that they knew. And so, and when they start, when the dots got connected, there was like, oh, you got, you have to have her on because she knows what she's talking about. So I got curious and I wanted to know more about black theater from a black woman's perspective as well and learn more about black women in theater. So I decided to reach out and, and hook this up. So I have Miss Renee Matthews Jackson on today. How you doing, Miss Renee? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank uh, no, you for having me on. Uh, no problem. Thank you for being on and thank you for um, helping me go on this journey to learn more about my history, especially the history within black theater, because like I said, didn't really learn a lot about it growing up. And as a historian, I want to make sure I know my information, but uh, I understand sometimes you got to reach out. If you want to learn okay. some things, you got to go digging for it. So that's why I'm glad we could make this happen and welcome to my channel. And we want to make sure we roll out the red carpet for you. Thank you very much. I'm esteemed to be here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So let's start by giving us some information about yourself. Like, who is Renee Matthews Jackson? Like, who are you? What's some background information about you? And how did you ultimately 
gain an interest or become inspired to get into the arts and particularly theater? Um, well, I am Renee Matthews Jackson. I'm also known as Mother Rapper and Poetryality in the uh, poetry circles. And I'm a mother of four children, grown children, seven grandchildren, and I've been married 47 years. And um, when I was very young, that's when I became an artist. That's when I knew I wanted theater. I was very imaginative. Um, I spoke in rhyme in first grade kindergarten because I heard nursery rhymes, and that's how I thought you were supposed to speak. And so it was always in me, but I didn't begin to cultivate it until um, I became an adult and I really said, I'm going to pursue my dreams. This is what I want to do. And I sought after it. And Caramel House is right in Cleveland. So it was easy. Okay. And I had been there as a child. It's a historical African-American theater. And um, my mom was at KVO, which is Caramel Volunteer Organization. And so she took the kids with she would make us go to Caramel instead of to the corner, to the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know what kind of sense that made because Caramel was 10 blocks away. The swimming pool was right <laughs> down the street. Right. But uh, she knew what she was doing. So my mom and my dad helped influence us um, and mold us into who we are. And they're both transitioned, but their spirit is, you know, like on the shoulders of giants is such a wonderful um, organizational name for you Thanks. because that's who our ancestors are. They are those giants. Yes. And so my, my parents made me who I am. That's who I am, who my parents made me. And it was all good. Okay. Okay. All right, so that's now that your... doesn't mean I didn't choose my own route sometime and do what I wanted to do. Exactly. But right, right, right. I had the basics. Right. Now that's I, understandable because like here we, we try to make sure we we're whole humans here, so we we yes, want to make sure yes. we get the full story. All right, so yes. I'm curious because as as I was looking through the website and some of the information, the title "Mother Rap." All right, so how did you how did you get that? How did that how did that title come about and get stuck to you? Um, that title came about like in maybe 1980 85. 86. I know my youngest son was born in 83, so was, he was still a little fella mm -hmm. when my kids started listening to rap. Okay. And I was like, what is this? And so they bring in the cassette tapes, you know, and if it was explicit lyrics, my husband would rip the tape out of the thing, so it would ruin it. And so they started sneaking, and of course their friends were listening to it, so they were listening to it. Right. And I said, oh, I said, rap ain't nothing but poetry with a beat. I'm a poet. I could rap. And so they challenged me, like, write a rap there, mom. I'm like, they gonna challenge me to write. <laughs> right. I'm a writer. <laughs> so um, I wrote my first rap called Homemaker's Rap. And I'll spit a little, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> it goes... I am rapping in the kitchen and I'm rapping strong. I can't stand these dirty dishes for long. Sweat is pouring off of my head only. Wish that I could come from work and go straight to bed. I can't stand these dishpan hands no more. A woman's work is never done, you know. Mop up the floor, clean out the junk door. Where my kids, they out fighting the kids next door. Well, I could only wish that I had a maid, but I can't afford one, I'm afraid. I'm not the only one around here that eats, and I'm surely not the one to get all the treats. Get dinner by six, a golden rule. Got to get my babies ready for school. Clothes in the basement need washing too. Got so much housework that I don't know what to do. I think a vacation is owed to me. My old man doesn't understand, you see. He helps out as much as he can, but a woman's work can't be done by a man. <laughs> okay. That's just a part of it. Okay. I didn't do the whole thing. Yeah, so, no, so I'm going to say this. All right, so if I'm your son and I challenge you to, to spit a rhyme, and you hit me with that. I'm looking at you like, okay, you've been holding out. You've been holding out <laughs> for a long time. What? How can we just not see that? That's what I would be thinking. 
<laughs> well, my kids were embarrassed by Mother Rapper in the beginning because I made her a character, a caricature instead of a character. She had on uh, fluffy house shoes and tube socks and an apron. She had a mop and she had rollers with a bandana in her hair. Mm -hmm. And she only put on the makeup because she was going out. So she was a real, and it was an embarrassing character. But when you see that character walk on stage and everybody's laughing at the character, I had a method to my madness. Mm -hmm. Then I spit. They was like, oh, everybody, oh, you know, so. But then my kids made me drop the caricature and just be me, be my right. rapper. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, I like it, though. I like it, though, because the origins <laughs> of it, it's like, okay, y'all going to try me like that, like my pen game. Ain't right, like, right, right. I'm like, right. dang, they going to they gonna say, I'm right at rap then. So I was like, <laughs> okay. Right. And that now was the cool. start. My okay. children were my challenge. Right, right. Now, I, I like that. Okay, so we know how you were introduced to theater. We know mm -hmm. how Mother Rap was born. So as far as your start in theater, like when did you get your start in theater and who were some of the people or what were some key events that played a pivotal role in your start in theater? Well, my start in theater happened in the 86-87 season at Caramel House. And Caramel is located on 89th and Quincy, the heart of the ghetto in Cleveland, Ohio. But it's world-renowned. And um, so they were having auditions. And I just yeah. decided, okay, well, I'm going to go audition for a place. So guess what? Instead of being me, I dressed up. I put on a pinstripe suit with a pencil skirt, I got my hair done, took a briefcase, all of this. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know who I was trying to be. <laughs> <laughs> and so the uh, executive director, Margaret Ford Taylor, who has been in theater like 70 years, she's still alive. She's my mentor. Um, she um, looked me up and down. She said, hmm, you must think you me. Well, I didn't <laughs> know who she was, but I respect my elders. So I was like, yes, ma'am, I surely do. So I auditioned for this play. I got a little part, mm -hmm. a little part, like eight lines. I can handle that. Like, I ain't never did a play. I could do eight lines, you know. <laughs> but two weeks before the show opened, the matriarch of the play dropped out. And the director, Rosina, she's passed on now. Rosina said, OK, Renee, I need you to do this uh, Maddie Williams role. And mm -hmm. it was The River Niger by Joseph Walker, which is a very famous classic play. Right. And I was like, I, I can't do all that. That's a lot of life. <laughs> and she said, you can and you will. And the seasoned actors in this play, Jackie Thompson, Hank Marone, Cal Thompson, they're all deceased. They took me by the hand. Aisha Shakur, they took me by the hand and they said, come on. We'll show you the ropes because you've got mm -hmm. potential. That was it. After that, I was smitten. You know, I, I went to the theater to, to put in a play I had written and got snagged by the theater bug. Right. Because I just wanted them. I wanted to sit in the audience and watch them do the play I wrote. I right. did not want to be on stage. And they kind of threw out the bait and I grabbed it. <laughs> so it's 30 some years later now. Right. Now, that's that's cool because a lot of times things will be thrown at you or your past in life will come and you're not expecting this particular path. Like, to be honest, if I when I was in high school, if you would have told me this, what I'll be doing at this point in my life, I would have laughed at you because I, I would I, I know I like history, but I never knew I would be doing this with it. So um, mm -hmm. I understand what, what you're saying, where you had this one objective, but then, you know, life, life threw you a bone and you took it and you ran with it. So. Yes. Yes. So and it's been um, uh, one of my um, passions ever since. Right. Right. Poetry is my heart. I, I mm -hmm. can write a poem just by one word, just throw out a word. I can write a poem. And even if it's just a haiku, five, seven, five, you know, I've created um, poetry forms. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a progressive form on allpoetry.com that I created. There's another one um, called a Ren Rhyme I created. And uh, so that's my, that's my love. That's the love of my life. That's what mm -hmm. kicked off everything else is the poetry. Right. 
Okay. My grandmother used to say, if you have a talent and you don't use it, you lose it. Right. But if you use it, it'll grow. Right. 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 Okay. Now, def definitely uh, understand that because there are a lot of people who we know at one point they were good at something, but you see them years later and they put it aside. You're like, what happened? But, you know, the, the lack of use. So that, that makes me think of this question. Um, so poetry came before theater. So yes. is there a connection between poetry and theater as far as for an artist? Is there any connection between it? And if so, could you explain the connection and how it worked for you? Well, historically, there's a great connection. If you look at Langston Hughes, mm -hmm. the poet, um, and all the plays he wrote, Mm -hmm. um, and um, other novelists like James Baldwin and the plays he wrote. So literature, which is poetry, and theater are very, you, first of all, you can't have a play without a script unless it's a mime. Mm -hmm. And I do mime and I teach mime. Mm -hmm. And mime is expression without speech. Right. So expression without speech. That's mine. And if I had a white face and gloves on, that would look great. But just right. me doing it uh, without costumes. So the correlation between literature, which is poetry, and theater is a, a, a bond that can't be broken, that that's, was all, already existed. Mm -hmm. So I, wa I want to do like Shakespeare is poetic theater. Right. Right. I never cared for Shakespeare until I got into theater, like in high school when they tried to for it, force it down our throats. I didn't like right. it. Right. But then when I got into theater, I appreciated it. I still kind of, <laughs> it's okay to me. It's not. Right. Like, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> August Wilson is up there. Those kind of places up mm -hmm. there for me, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. They talk about our experience. And, and I, I, I feel blessed that I do know black theater. Because when you go to college and study theater, that's not what you're taught. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned black theater at a theater in my hometown, which I was familiar with. I grew up in that area, you know, so I'm just one of the fortunate ones, I think. Right, right. So I'm gonna I'm rearrange my order of my question because well, I, that's I need- to you. I, I need to know now because I think it'll help better as we as the conversation flows. So the Carmel House. All right. I've yes. heard the, I've heard the gentlemen talk about the Carmel House when they were on with me. You were talking about it in the comments. We're talking about it now. And you saying you spent time there. So can you explain like fully what it is and why it's so influential to to black artists? Well, let me share it this way. When I first went to Caramel House, I went um, under the direction of Jeff Grashevsky. Uh -huh. And he had written a model program to tour into the schools, adults touring children's plays, right? Uh -huh. And um, I stuck with that program the whole nine years I was there. Um, but I moved from just being an actor to being the assistant director of the program. And I, I Caramel, I actually wrote a play. I told you I went there to do a play and I got snagged. Mm -hmm. I wrote a play. I took it to the Playhouse, which is right around the corner from Caramel, the big, uh, um, uh, you know, rich people's theater. Mm -hmm. I'll put it like that. The uh, less melanated people's theater. Right. And um, they had a, a playwriting festival and my play was supposed to be in it. Well, my play never appeared in it. And I was sitting in the audience like a raisin and a piece of white bread. And then I discovered that my play wasn't even in the thing. And so I was very upset, drove over to Caramel. They were having something. I went inside, I saw Diane Wilson and I cried on her shoulder and I told her what happened. And she said, give me the play. And that's, that's the basis of, uh, me being on stage, me being hired, me being, it was a mishap, a mishap at the famous theater, the Cleveland mm -hmm. Playhouse. And I'll say the name because this actually happened. Right. But, and, and, and we dealt with 
um, systemic and, and institutionalized racism. I mean, Cleveland, we're talking about Cleveland, Ohio. And so I went to that little theater who made, got 10% of what the big theater got and did just as good plays, but they were black oriented. Right. And we did, um, um, what do you call it? Multicultural casting where Cat, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, which was always done by um, our Caucasian actors, was being done by a black cast mm -hmm. at Caramel House. And we're world renowned. Um, Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston wrote Mule Bone. They had an argument over it, fell out, never spoke again. And so from that, I wrote a play called Bone Pickin', which I can't tell you too much about it. We read mm -hmm. it uh, in Tallahassee in 2019 with um, the studio on West Georgia Street. Mm -hmm. Frenchtown Coalition for the Arts. Right. And it's about this what if Langston and Zora got back together. What would they talk about? What would they, what would be the conversation? And I actually had them meet in a loft, uh, you know, and I'm not going to tell anymore because it's a <laughs> fabulous play. And it's only two characters. So I'm going to approach um, Essential Theater about producing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to approach them. Uh, okay. I've done a couple of things with them for the holidays, and so now they can help me out. It's All right. it's give and take. Okay, so well, since you've mentioned it, essential theater for those who don't mm -hmm. know, because that's right <laughs> along the lines of what we're talking about. Could you explain to people what essential theater is? Essential theater is fam used theater. And I think Dr. Matthews is still the dean of theater uh, in charge. I'm not sure. Um, but when I first came here and I to Tallahassee, I'm, I'm in Ocala now. When mm -hmm. I came to Tallahassee, I said, I got to go to a theater. I got to find a theater. And Summer was one of the first, Summer Hill Seven was one of the first artists I met. And he said, go to Essential Theater. I'm sure you know Essential Theater because Kiramu knows Essential Theater. Mm -hmm. I said, fam, you. I went in the moment I walked in the door, I felt like home. I felt like Caramel's proscenium. And so I've been working with them. I did the Christmas holiday event and I'm doing also the Black History event they're having. Um, and I hope to work closer with, cause that's why I came here, mm -hmm. you know? And I did theater Tallahassee. Right. And that's a, 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 a European. I should say they don't do much black theater or if they do any. Um, but, and I was the first African and American in, and then there were none, which is a very racist um, story in its beginnings. It was called 10 little niggas on nigga Island. Wow. And then it got to America and it was changed to 10 little Indians. That's where the song comes from. Okay. Okay. And guess who it was written by? Who is that? Agatha Christie. <laughs> and then she changed it to the last line in the play, uh, in the book, uh, and then there were none. And that's mm -hmm. how it adapted its title. But I was the first African-American in history of that play, being in that play. Right. And my mentor said, why would you do that play? Why would you? She was so fired up and mad at me. And I said, I don't know. Let's just see why I did it. Well, I'm going to do it, you know. I'm hungry for some theater. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I played a, a very significant role, so. Okay. Well, okay. So looking looking back, uh, what would you say your reasoning and what would you say the overall outcome come from you playing that role in that particular play? Well, first of all, I like being first. I was the first African-American to ever play the role. And other African-Americans will probably frown on like, why would you want to be in that? And I played the cook. Mm -hmm. And they said, there she go with a, the apron on and, you know, like a maid. And I had a line. I took the role because there was a line in the play that said, I am not the maid. I am the cook. Ask anybody in this house who the cookie is. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I was defined. And uh, Tallahassee Democrat did a uh, review of it, and they said that myself and uh, Bob Burke, Burkhart, I think it's last name, I can't spell it, but he's in Tallahassee, that, and he was a minority, 
Uh, he was a brown person. He he and I um, were the stable parts of the play or something like that. It was a very good critique. And so I did it because I could. Mm -hmm. I knew I could go in there and get that audition and get that role, a role that a black person had never gotten. Right. And so it was, you know, how people like challenges. We're in my family, we're very competitive. <laughs> Everybody competes. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but it, I mean, to me, people can have their opinion. People can agree or disagree, but it's all subjective to a lot of those people at the end of the day. It's your opinion, and it is what it is, right? And because yeah. to me, I, I don't think we should look at it in the lens of right or wrong. It's just, it's what you did, and did you enjoy your experience? So, I did. I, I really it. did. And and it's my craft. It's what I do. Right. And so right. that wasn't me up there anyway. It was the character. Right. I was just exactly. the vehicle the character used to come to life. Right. No, I so that's you. why I can do it, too, because I, I, it ain't me up there. Right. It's, right. It's somebody else. <laughs> so let's jump back to the Caramel House real quick. Who, besides yourself, who was some of the Black actors who came out of the Caramel House um, who were impactful, whether they were well-known or less known. Margaret Ford Taylor. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, she's my mentor and she's still alive. I, as a matter of fact, I talked to her last week and um, I always get inspired when I talk to Margaret. And because she is an elder and my mom's gone, sometimes I have to reach out to my uh, elders that are here when right. I can't reach my ancestors. I, and so Margaret and I had a long conversation and she's always encouraging to me. Um, but that's one, Margaret Ford Taylor and Jean Hawkins. I remember I had to play a lesbian <clears throat> in a long time since yesterday. And I thought I was all open-minded. I'm a theater person. We're very open-minded people, okay? Mm -hmm. But I was having difficulty with this character because I had to make her real. Right. And I talked to Jean, and Jean took me backstage, and we prayed, and she said, you know who you are, but you got to make that character believable. So you're going to get up there and do that character, and you're making too much of it. And it taught me to let my guard down. You know, I had a, I was young. I was a young actor at that time. And so Jean Hawkins, and she's, she's transitioned. And um, Bill Cobb, I, I'm sure you know that name. Uh, what was it? Nino Brown, I'll see you in hell. Okay, yeah, yes. That shot Nino Brown at the end. I mean, that's, that's how I make people know him. But he's been in everything you can imagine. Right. And he still is, even though he is now walking with a cane. He's still in the movies. And so he is Bill. And I haven't talked to Bill since COVID-19, and that really bothers me. But I know he's okay because I do communicate with him on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, and some other names um, out of there, Ruby D. I was mistaken for Ruby D one evening. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, I am not Ruby D, honey. You just got the wrong person all together. Right. And I took the young lady, she was a student, over to where Miss D was sitting because we had done a show together and we were all out um, afterwards. We used to go to Lancers afterwards. That was the spot. Um, it was a uh, very historical spot, too. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I took her over to meet Miss D, and I told I told Miss D, I said um, she wouldn't let us call her Miss D. We had to call her Ruby. I told Ruby, I said um, she just mistook me from for you, and she said, "Huh, I could be your grandmother." I said, "No, you could not be. <laughs> you could be my mother, but you could be my grandmother." <laughs> but she was a wonderful, whimsical woman, and. At Caramel, you might want to pull that up at some time. Uh -huh. There's a mural, uh, like a, 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 I don't know, it's a hundred and something feet mural of her on the side of the building. Okay. That a, a black artist in Cleveland painted. Right, right. And so Caramel, Caramel is a multidisciplinary theater. So you have dancers and 
uh, visual artists and musicians and mine and everything is there. Everything mm -hmm. about performance art theater is there and visual art theater. Okay. Because you got to have a visual artist to make a set. You do. You do. You got to have a carpenter sometime. Right. <laughs> a pipe vendor. Right. Well, yeah, I, it's like a team, though. You know, and that's how I look mm -hmm. at it. You got to have all your components of the team to make yes. it work. Now, I'm not yes. familiar with the terms and all of the different roles that are that are, are played out or different people who go into making the play happen. But I, I've, I've <laughs> like my little brief um, time in in plays or in the production is um, my job was to pull the curtain open. And I was gonna be the You're best curtain, curtain opener. I was gonna be That's the best curtain, curtain puller ever. Yes. ever. Like, <laughs> but it's just under timing. Just understanding that my timing was so important, even though I'm looking at myself as insignificant as the curtain no. puller. But my timing is so important. And if I don't pull this curtain in time, it can right. throw off the timing of everything. And yes. those curtains are heavy. You was yes. a little guy. Those things are right. those, those curtains are heavy. Did right. you have to, have to do any flies? I don't. I, it was it was it was low budget, so it wasn't hard to get it get okay. it going. Yeah. But yeah. I I just understood that if I didn't get it out in the time when they gave me the signal, that it was going to throw off it. Right. Right. Yeah. We need the curtain puller to open the curtain so the show can start. So you probably were the most important person on that stage at that right. time. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <Okay. laughs> so there is the and that's the beautiful thing about theater. There is no right or wrong and there is no insignificant ever. Everybody mm -hmm. from the costumer uh, to the person who does your makeup or your hair um to the i don't know the the stage manager oh my god the show goes to the stage manager after the director puts the show up then the director say okay bye i'm going to direct another show and mm -hmm. it's the stage manager's show right so everybody the 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 set designer everybody light designer everybody is a very intricate part of making what the audience sees which is not even the polished product yet. The polished product happens the night the show is going to be over because you finally say, oh my God, that's how that line should have been mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. I've been saying that line like, turn the light out, sweetheart. And it should have been, turn the light out, sweetheart. <laughs> so it, that night I said, oh my God, I got that's the best show. You right. want to see a good play, go to the last show. Right, right, right. Okay. All right, so... Not only did the Caramel House was it an institution of ed the education of the arts, a, a education of the history, especially of black artists and black theater, but it fostered technical skills and and practical skill sets for people who may not have been artists, or even for artists to make themselves more valuable. For my understanding, yes. that's what you're saying. Yes, yes, and it started. Uh, the Jellops, Rowena and and um, what's his name, R Rowena and I can't think of Mr. Jellops name. But anyway, they started the theater because they had a, a settlement house down on mm -hmm. 38th and Chester, 36th and Chester and down in the deep ghetto. And and black people would migrate in the backyard of the facility and sing and dance and just have a good old time. And they thought, well, everybody needs to see this. We letting this talent go to waste. And they brought us in and Caramel uh, flourished during the Harlem Renaissance period. Okay. So it's, it's part of the fabric of Cleveland and the fabric of America. Okay. Because hundreds and hundreds of, um, I remember I have a picture of Chip Fields signing uh, our wall. We had a wall where we would, after we did a play, we put the line up, the, our most favorite line, mm -hmm. and then put our name underneath. And so this wall had all Billy D. Williams was on there, uh, Terrence Howard. I mean, just people that just came to visit the facility because it is the oldest Black uh, African American uh, theater. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, new administration came in and painted over the wall. 
Come on. Yeah. That's yeah, crazy. They didn't know. They didn't know. They they were in there to try to save the theater. And basically they kind of sort of did, but they right. didn't know. Okay. They didn't know the value of what but I understand that there's um some form of uh, what's that when you spray houses and clean them off? The, um the little power spray. Yeah, the little power tool. Um, yeah, there's pressure some wash form stuff. of power pressure wash that could yeah. get um the the top coat of paint off and we could recover okay. those. And and maybe one day I'll propose that to Kiramu as a project. Right. And all those names that are still alive that are on that wall can pay for it. Right. Right. Because okay. I want my name to be seen on that. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> I don't blame you. Okay, so so I have this question. Um as an as an artist, I I understand that just because you're black, that doesn't mean that you're only gonna be influenced by black artists, because as an artist, you look at art as a whole. Mm -hmm. But for the sake of the platform and the conversation, um, I do. I am interested in which black artist um, influenced you directly or indirectly, and um, how did those artists influence you? Because I'm just trying to get a sense of. Because I, I I know you having interactions with Ruby D and some of the mm -hmm. other artists that you've already mentioned, but who are some of the ones who you would say? influenced you to be the artist that you are, even help influence the creation of Mother Rapper and the platforms that you have today? Wow. Um, <clears throat> as far as a, um, a poet, I would say Maya Angelou uh -huh. was a great influence. And of course, I mean, I've seen his ghost. I think I may have seen him as a kid. Didn't know who he was. Langston Hughes. Mm -hmm. And um, because he had an apartment at Caramel House. Okay. And uh, the apartment became our drama theater for youth office. Mm -hmm. and so he was always in there. Right. <laughs> and um, so those two, if you want male and female, but I can also say names like um, I admired Esther Roll uh -huh. because brown skinned women have had a very hard time and she fought against the odds and they said she was unattractive but see you gotta I was taught to see beyond the, the skin and see into the soul uh -huh. and Esther Roll permeated a wonderful soul to me. Now, I don't know how she was in person, but to watch her and Diane Carroll, I mean, there's so many Black women that uh, Cicely Tyson in my heart, just Cicely Tyson was my mentor and she didn't even know it. Uh -huh. Because uh -huh. I only played, because of her, I only played roles. I had, I had one in 30 years, one role where I had to cuss. And it was the, at, in my very first play. And I said, I'd never cuss again. Okay. In River Niger, when I had to say, and you better not F up. Mm -hmm. And I said it like I was supposed to say it and I meant it, but I cringed afterwards, you know. Because Mother Rapper don't use no cussing. I don't right. use no cussing. All my rhymes are clean. I rap right. to young folk day in, day out. I don't have to holler. I don't have to shout. Just have to rhyme. I do it all the time. It comes naturally because it's poetry. <laughs> there you go. I like that. I like that. That's smooth. <laughs> <laughs> nah, but but that's, that's artistry as well. Um, when you can, especially nowadays, uh, where our hip hop that we have, um, I think we've uh, a sense of the artistry is lost on the mainstream level, not totally, but on the mainstream level. And this, you got to follow this specific formula and not understanding how it really connects back to the roots of theater and poetry and things like that to bring it alive as you were. Mm -hmm. As you were saying your rhymes over the beat and making it believable, whether you did it or not, you still got to make it believable. So there's the, right. there's that that whole theatrical aspect about being that hip hop artist that well, I kinda 
go back and answer my own question about the connection between <laughs> <laughs> poetry and, and theater. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So the Caramel House, oh man, it, it produced so many people. Like I right, Langston Hughes, he had an office. So it was it was all so how did that like how did that happen? And did other artists like Langston Hughes have little spot set up in the caramel house to just work um, on that art. I understand that Robert Guillaume um, was a resident there for several months. And that and then you also have um what's his name? I love him so much as a real person. Um Superfly. Um oh. Oh my God! Why can't I think of his my, name? Are you talking about Tony Fargus? No, Superfly, the real uh, Superfly okay. from back in the day. Oh, the real, um, real Superfly. Yeah, I can't think of his name. Okay, I, I can, but everybody knows who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Somebody should be typing in saying who he was. So. Right. <laughs> um, but um, he's from Caramel House, and he okay. he toured there. And then you've got a uh, Debbie Allen who had several. Um, what do you call them when when you're they're under your tutelage? Several um, like people, yes, and yeah. proteges, you know, yeah, right. and they would come to Caramel, and then Mike Malone, who was very famous at the Kennedy Center in Washington D.C. I remember being in a rehearsal for Black Nativity with Mike Malone till four o'clock in the morning. He <laughs> was like, uh -uh. and then finally Jean, she was like. Mike, you got to send these kids home. <laughs> right. So there have been icons. Ira, Al uh, Ira Aldridge was studied very heavily at Caramel House. Paul Robeson was at Caramel House. Um, um, and so many other artists came through, musicians, songstress, vocalists, mm -hmm. because I actually was a liaison there. When I first went, that was, you know, you I worked with the Drama Theater Youth Program, but I had other little jobs Margaret would send me on. And so I my job was to invite any black artists that came into Cleveland to visit Caramel House while they were there. If they were there for a tour, a concert, whatever, mm -hmm. to visit the Hall of Fame, whatever. And um, I had Billy D. Williams. Um I rode a limo with him back to Caramel House. Okay. <laughs> they asked to be Tally. He was a costume. He said, no, that didn't. Get out that car with Billy D. Williams. I said, yes, her did. <laughs> <laughs> and I still have his photograph, his aut uh, autograph uh, picture. And so it was, and in the Renaissance time, it was a heyday mm -hmm. for anybody who stopped through Cleveland. Bear and Leo's Casino, those two places where the, okay. the, the musicians went to Leo's and the, the actors and, and film actors and stage actors went to Caramel. Right. Okay. So you had a chance to interact with some talented people. Oh, in your time. I, I, Denzel Washington held my hand for like 30 seconds. <laughs> hey, that was a long 30 seconds. <laughs> you, it was an eternity to me. He was like, nice to meet you, shaking my hand. You know, I was on the set. I, right. I was an extra in uh, Anton Fisher's story, right? Okay. So he's shaking my hand and giving me my directions because he was the director. He was such a perfectionist. And um, I'm looking in the, in, in the eye and I'm saying, okay, I'm an actor too. He, he's not the star. Calm down. Stay calm. Stay. Well, in the meantime, the little girl who was my 10-year-old daughter in the in the film, she was having fits. He had to take, let, that's the only reason he had to let go of my hand too, was to calm her. I was trying to keep her calm. But uh, yeah, and Denzel's, he is just, oh, his, he's, there's another one with that great, great spirit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very high energy, a high vibe person. So yeah, I've done that some people. That's great. That's great. And some, and some people that met me. Right. I met Toni Morrison. I smoked a cigarette with her. I shouldn't tell people that. But uh, she's like, I, I took a cigarette out to smoke after she had did a reading at Cleveland State University. <laughs> she saw me. She said, baby, you got another one of those. 
And I said, yes, ma'am. I got the whole pack, you know. It's Toni Morrison asking me for a cigarette. <laughs> and I sat down with her and we talked for 20 minutes. She signed my book, Beloved. And uh, she said, she said, it was nice having a chat with you over a cigarette on a bench at <laughs> Cleveland State. I'm right. like, wow. Right, right. Wow. Yeah. Being but you know, it, the path you set, and Summer and I have talked right. about this before, is the path, it has the people on it that are set there for you. As long as you keep on that path. Right. Now, yeah. I, I've strayed. I've strayed to some dark places, you know. But I always knew that that path was over there. And it was my choice if I wanted to pick it up again. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so at this this time in my life, I'm not doing this for me anymore. I'm doing it for those seven beautiful grandchildren I have. And I have one, two of them that I know for sure want to be three that want to be artists. Right. And the other ones are just, just talented, period. You know, it's in our genes. I right. hate to sound all braggadocious, but no, my no, mom but, and daddy but, was something else. But that's how it is, though. Some people, you know, born with these gifts, and you have to know how to cultivate these gifts that people are born with. So, yes, like me, yes. I, I was born to talk. If it's one <laughs> thing I know how to do, and it's talk. So just cultivate that skill, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you do a good job. Your interview, I'm very comfortable. With yes, your interview, I mean, it's real, it's live, it's not um, contrived or nothing. You know, mm -hmm. you sent me them questions, and I looked at them, and I said, "Okay, I'm just gonna answer whatever he asks." <laughs> hey, but but I always, I always, I always have. For me, I'm big on structure, so just mm -hmm. have them so we can have a direction. But you always let the conversation flow. Oh, yes, you do. do yes, yes, you do. Yes, My friend, my friend who's an actor in Tallahassee, she was like, okay, so go study the answers. I said, girl, I'm not about to do that. that. I got to yeah. work tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. It ain't that serious. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think the arts are important. I really do. Um, I, I've, I've seen how the arts have been influential in my life. I've seen how the arts have been influential in the lives of my friends and other people that I've gone to school with. Um, but in particular, theater and black theater, could you elaborate on why it's important and um, how its importance is of use to our community? Black theater tells our story. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've adapted several novels from Black writers and put them on stage. We've made films from Black writers. And the theater tells our story. And Langston Hughes, I believe, said we had to be for the people, by the people, and of the people. And he was talking about Black people because our story has been told quote unquote, and we're finding out in leaps and bounds that it wasn't true, aren't we? Right. Because we didn't tell it. Mm -hmm. And theater gives us a platform to tell our story. One of my favorite writers of this time, and he has passed on, is August Wilson. Mm -hmm. And August is a very wordy playwright. There's lots of words in his scripts. And we were debating about how many roles he gave to women, because I can only think about like four or five of his plays where there are more than one woman in the play. Mm -hmm. But I think because he was writing from that African-American male's perspective and he didn't want to uh, contrive the woman's side of it. Of course, he probably had female influences, but I'm not questioning his style. Mm -hmm. I just know that it tells, theater allows us to tell our story our way. Right. right. You know, with no inhibitions, no, I have to put in that filter, I have to put in this filter. It's just like, I'm going to say this, and I got to say this, the word nigger. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say it one way, it pisses me off. Mm -hmm. But when you say it another way, I'm okay. 
And and then when somebody said, oh, it's just a word, that makes me really angry mm -hmm. because kill is just a word. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So let's not play with words like that. Um, but if you took that word out of our literature, you would have gaping holes in a whole period of literature. I don't want you to do that. Right. I don't want the rappers to take it out of their lyrics. What I want from the rappers is because you have the attention of these young people, I want you to give a conscientious message. Mm -hmm. All that other beads and, 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 and all that stuff. How valid is that? Right. How valid is that really? So now we become animals. We're we're dogs and bitches. What? What? Really? Who said? Because the music industry promotes that because we are not owners. Mm -hmm. So he gets into a whole, but take your platform like you're doing. Right. You gotta be making people proud of what you're doing. I hope so. Because you're you're taking this platform and you're introducing. I look on your page and some of these people, I'm supposed to be a history, black history person. I ain't never heard of them. Right. And I have to read it because I've never heard of this person. I did a play where it was all 101, no, 1,001 black historical inventors. And we actually crammed 100, 100. 1,001 Black Inventors into this play. Mm -hmm. It was a play, it was done like a talk show. So there was answers to questions. So if we didn't, if, if, the, if it wasn't that person that was the answer, it was still listed. So you still right. got that name, you know. <clears throat> and I, some of the people you have on your page, I, I don't know who they are, Joseph. <laughs> right. I mean, being educated. And then you bring on today's artists. And you've got these ancestors over here, and, and then you have today's artists. That's just phenomenal. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Because, like you say, um, nobody should be telling our own stories. I, in my opinion, black theater is important. Um, when I I took a, a history of black theater class, or black, yeah, just black movies and black. I think it was more mm -hmm. no history of black cinema class. Mm. And the the instructor did a good job um of laying it out. And it was it was a great book. I think Tom Coots, Tom Coots, Goon, Coons, Mulattoes and Mammies. I think something the title is something similar mm -hmm, to that. Mm -hmm. But it laid out a great history of black cinema. But one thing it did, it started with uh, Oscar Michaud and his wife. And so for those who don't know, Oscar Michaud was the first uh, black person to direct the movie, to create a movie, to produce the movie. But the movie was in response to the Birth of a Nation movie. And the Birth of a mm -hmm. Nation movie was straight white propaganda. Right, right, right. Th them telling our stories, making a black man look like a a um, a An cocaine. Idiot. Right, a cocaine uh, induced uh, rapist. rapist. Right. Yes. And so black theater was created so we could tell our own stories in a visual way, in a theatrical way, because clearly, like, think about it, white people, white people have gone so far as to say aliens built the pyramids, not black people, right. but aliens. Right, so, they don't want to ever give us the credit, but it's okay. We know, as long as right. we know. And you know, it's like my mother, I'm writing a book, and I, gosh, I started this book like a year after my mom passed, and she passed eight years ago, and it's called Things Our Mother Said, and everybody can relate to them. I'm not making them up. You've heard them before. It's just that my mother said them, and they stick in my head, mm -hmm. and my mother said, I think she said it was, don't ignore ignorance that does not know. Ignore ignorance that does know but doesn't want to behave like they know. Okay. That's those people who know it's wrong to, to oppress or to think they're superior or whatever. They know it's wrong, but they don't want to know about it really. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and see, that's it. We, we, we have to, send a message to the next generations yep. that yes, you built the pyramids, 
that's not a big deal for us to build things like that. We are the mother of invention. Right. If you look at what's been the stoplight, look at the, what the stoplight does. Gary yeah. Morgan, we went to, um, um, my kids went to school with a granddaughter or a great granddaughter, granddaughter, I think, great grand, I don't know, with Gary Morgan. And mm -hmm. they went to their garage around the corner from our house and there was a gas mask. In the, like it was nothing. Right. You know, so we're the mother of invention. We're the mother of all invention. We are, uh, they call Africa the cradle of humanity. Uh, we are the mother uh, of the, uh, the earth is, is, black women are the mother of everybody. That's why it pisses me off when, when, when everybody got to be fighting. Get, right. Go to your corners. Right. Let's figure this out. Are we going to be our own? Is what did Martin Luther King said? We're all going to perish if we don't realize that we're in this together. Right, right. So That's we got to tell tell you you were to keep 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 doing what you're doing, so that people can tell their stories. After and please keep doing what you're doing, and thank you for what you've done because are right, you you're telling us about all the people that influenced you, but I'm sure you've influenced a whole number of people as well. So <laughs> thank you for. What I have you a done. bunch of. I got a bunch of kids. I got a bunch <laughs> of people that are, I'll say they are 50 and under mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. are in my family and children I taught at Caramel and young people that I taught in classes or young people I coached. And I said, when I pass, I want a, a casket, a white casket, and I want it to have eraser board on it so kids could write graffiti all over it. My mother said, nobody's going to do that. Right. Right. But hey, that's what I want. And I put it out there now. So you guys <laughs> bring a big poster board when I pass. Mm -hmm. But I ain't going nowhere for 30 years. Uh, me and God have an understanding. I'll <laughs> pass when I'm like 96 and I'll be on stage playing a great, great grandmother who had a heart attack mm -hmm. and I'll actually die. And they'll be like, damn, she still got it. She don't look like she breathing. <laughs> <laughs> so I got about 30 more years to mess with people yeah. like that. Yeah. I just I could just see I just think about your your children's face when you tell them that they looking at you like what? Right. My kids be like, Ma, don't be talking about them. We don't want to talk about that stuff. Right. Right. <laughs> hey, it's That's coming funny. for everybody. <laughs> so let's tell us about your experience. In theater, overall, navigating through the the realm of black theater as a black woman, what's the, what's the experience like? Um, being an artist, being an actor, being on stage, being a writer, being a director, like what's the overall experience like for black women? For me, I love my life. I love my life. I love that I am a black woman experiencing this. Mm -hmm. I, I can, now uh, and I played male roles. Um, I played a, a a man from Ghana in uh, Fires in the Mirror, and this was a true story in 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 in, in New York, mm -hmm. in Crown Heights, I believe. Um, and I played the father of the son that was run over uh, by Jewish rebbies, and then that that became this conflict between the Jews and black people in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, so to play a man and to have the feelings of a father uh, seeing his black child run down or shot down or any kind of down is the other side of what I related to as a, all these women burying their sons. Right. So I had to play this character that was a man. And my director was kind of insane, and I'm saying this about you, Sarah, um, because she, at the end of the monologue, I could only let one tear fall down my face. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm like, how do you do that? But every night I did it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I did it. I did it because it's just a form of discipline, I guess. I don't know. But every night, and by the time that second tier was ready to go, they lights out. Mm -hmm. Timing, like you said, timing. Right. So 
my experience, I have met some of the best people in the world, whether they were uh, 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 up there on the ladder or way down there on the ladder. You know, I have met some of the most talented people. Uh And that's just not through Caramel House. That's when I got here. Right. Summer. Summer's amazing. He's amazing talent. To to be an attorney and give it up for theater is like right. Really? Are you serious there? Uh but he's got those three A's, author, actor, and attorney. That's awesome. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, and so I have this life, and whether anybody looks at it from their perspective as me being famous or productive or successful or whatever. I love my life. Um, And even the dark times, because they were lessons. They were lessons. Who wants to stay in the dark? So I visited the dark and then came out of the dark and realized, I don't want to go back there again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And maybe that's why I had to visit it in the first place. So theater brings about all of life. They ask the question, is theater life or is life theater? It's a little bit of both. Yes. It's hard to answer one without the other. Right, right. Because as a writer, as a playwright for the stage, I'm writing about real life, even if there's some makeup stuff in it. Mm -hmm. Like um, the uh, Gem of the Ocean by August Wilson. I had to play a 137-year-old woman. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't going to play her on and crepit and you get on and I was very, very pronounced in, in her. But I, it had the, you know, the little uh, Cajun or to it or whatever. But I was very pronounced in my words. Right. And I wasn't bent over. Her 137 to me was kind of just how I saw it. Mm-hmm. 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 So I don't know. I just, I think I have I, and to coin a phrase, I love my life. Right. Right. Now, and that's, I that's hope amazing. the children, young people, because I've taught, I've taught all over Cleveland, Ohio. I've taught here in Tallahassee. Um, I'm going to get a theater group out here in this condominium where I live because there's a big park that's not being used Mm -hmm. because the kids are all indoors. Well, you're in a park. We can do social distancing and do plays sitting on cubes or something, you know? Right. Um, So I'm not going to stop what I'm doing because I'm getting older. I I have arthritis, uh, but I'm not going to claim that to a point where it stops me. Right. Right. You know, so I, I just, I love my life. That's, That's my good. ultimate experiences. It's been good. It's been right. great. It's been a blessing. Right. Man, that's that's amazing. That's amazing. And I've I can tell you enjoy it because the passion that you that you use when you speak about <laughs> it and you speak about your life and your experiences. It's not coming from a, oh I did this and I had that. It's like I enjoy my experiences. So yes, yes. That's my kids cool. say, "Oh my, you're so dramatic," but I'd be like, "What my name is?" <laughs> right, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is this is the real me, though. Ain't nothing about this fake. Uh, I right. did put on some makeup because I worked all day, and I thought, okay, refresh right. your face. But I usually do wear makeup for, for stage, so I don't nice. wear it in real life. So if you see me, I'm gonna look different. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how many plays have you written? Oh my gosh, like twenty. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I'm not going to ask you to name all of them, but <laughs> just some of them. Um, kind of get an idea. Give us an idea of what goes into writing plays, what thought processes, what preparation goes into writing the plays. And um, just give us a little insight on some of the plays that you would want to speak about. Uh, like what's the play about and why did you write that play? Um, one of my favorites is um, Every Little Bit 
Mm-hmm. And it is a play about a 98 year old woman with Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. And my grandmother suffered, my father's mother suffered from Alzheimer's. So uh, she is my central character. It was very hard. My family took her in, you know, because grandmother lived by herself for so long. She had been so independent for so long. And she was in the, the valley in Pennsylvania. So my dad brought her. And we tried to care for her, but she had forgotten the point who daddy was and and she'd scream and holler, don't get that man away from me. And she would uh, try to pit one against the other. We knew it was the disease. It wasn't her, even though she was a, a she could be a mean little somebody. She was five feet tall <laughs> and I guess her height and she had predominantly males mm-hmm. because I had like. 22 male cousins, and it was four girls out of all my cousins. Sound like my mom. <laughs> yeah, so she had to be tough. You know, she had to be a whippersnapper. And so um, in order for me to release the pain of that experience with my grandmother, because when you're going through it, you don't realize how much it hurts when you're trying to care for somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote about that and we did a reading of it in Cleveland. Margaret Ford Taylor actually directed it mm-hmm. and it was, I was sitting in the audience and so the feedback was excellent. And they told me some very good things about the play to give more attention to the effect of Alzheimer's on the family. I should just show mainly the effect on, on Ida, the character. And so that's one of them. And I have been seriously thinking about wiping the dust off of that and contacting the Alzheimer's Association. But all the things I want to do, Joseph, I need a staff, man. I ain't got no staff. It's just me. Right. Right. Now I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> and another play is Bone Picking, the story of the what if of Zora right. Right. And, and Langston. And then one more I would say is... Uh, um, Let's Talk, which was read in Tallahassee at B-Sharp through Frenchtown okay. Coalition for the Arts and Somo Playhouse. Okay. Um, it was read in, I think it was September of 2019. Yeah, right before COVID hit that year before. Um, and uh, that's about five... Um, Sorority sisters who, ever since they got out of college 20 years ago, maybe, they meet every month at each other's house to play Pacino. And it is, now that's that's one that I want produced too. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. uh, uh, just the reading. The reading uh, at B Sharp went very, very well uh, to a sold out audience all three nights for just the reading. It wasn't even the mounted play, so <laughs> but it's been read. It that was about the third reading. It had been read twice before in Cleveland, and it got good reviews too. So it's time to mount the play. Right. Okay. And so um, it's funny you mentioned B Sharps because I've actually interviewed Dr. C on here. We talked about her research on the Lado Road uh, between oh, yes. India and China. Yes. So. So hey, yeah, that's oh, that's, yeah. that's fascinating. Yes, it is. That is very fascinating, and the way uh, Doctor C tells the story is fascinating. It as is, well. it is. And then I'm familiar with the work um, at Solmo Playhouse with E. Marie Cecil and Beatrice mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Head. So they do great work. Mm-hmm. So I got I yes. got to get them on here too to talk about some stuff. Yes. Yeah. All you, you got to do is add. You know, Solmo is on. Um, on Facebook, and then the within see that was my thing with Frenchtown Coalition for the Arts to get all of these different instead of us being so splintered, because Frenchtown is under fire for gentrification right now. Mm-hmm. That's why they put up them blocks with the history right. and the street signs because when they eliminate all the houses, they at least have something to tell you about it. Exactly. Exactly. And so Frenchtown Coalition for the Arts was a means for all of these different entities like Poemity TV with Summer and everybody's groups to come together to fight this 
historically black community, which is the oldest African-American community in the state of Florida. And if that's not true, it came out of the mayor's mouth Mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I've met with the mayor on occasion, three occasions, and it is, and, and instead of, you're talking about saving trees, save these houses, these African American generational houses. Right. You see. So uh e. Marie and 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 Giltricia and and Cynthia Rose and Stan Johnson and all of these artists, Nola uh, Khan with her massage therapy, she has magical hands. Um we came together and we were about ready to do it and then COVID hit. Yeah, I I was okay. So I knew of I didn't okay. I've I've known some of the work that you've been a part of because uh, I talked with Miss Cynthia Rose. We talk often. Um, mm-hmm. We we're, we're both are part of Tallahassee Authors Network. I've met Mr. Stan. Oh, I've seen yeah. her out. Um, I'm familiar with a lot of the things. Uh, Vonzel, Deshaun, Springtime, all of it. So I work you know, with Vonzel. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I do my best to support. So um you did a play. I think Gil Tricia and E. Marie Cecil did it. It was I can't remember the name of the play. I know Women was, Warriors. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I enjoyed that. I, I caught the last show at Nefertari's. I that was a that. good production man that was well and you know the beautiful part about it was act two was basically scripted in the form of uh, focus Mm -hmm. but most of it was ad-libbed okay and nobody knew that because we had gotten so Emery did such a good job in Giltricia directing us how to move from one focus to the next. It wasn't scripted like that. It was just like the women are in this round table, they're having this conversation and it has to go from here to here to here. Now how you guys do it and get it there is up to you. And we had a ball. We right. had a it was illegal to have that much fun on stage. <laughs> <laughs> now that's that's cool because me sitting in the audience, I couldn't uh, tell that you guys were free flowing. You guys were feeding off mm-hmm. of each other. Like that's that's mm-hmm. so cool. That's great direction though, as well. Like to know, yeah, and it, it would right change, position. right? Night, night after night, it would be different because you're still at living. You don't have a script. You don't have anything memorized, but you have these uh, uh, vocal points, and we had to touch each one of them. And it was very well directed. Yes, it was. Oh, that's cool. Ah, oh, that's cool. So, um, before we before we wrap this up, I want to know. If I'm, whether I'm young, older, in the middle, season, wherever I am in life, and theater is something that I want to be a part of, theater is something that I want to pursue, what advice would you give to anyone looking to get in, not just the acting aspect, but any aspect of theater, what advice would you give them to be able to start their journey and to actually be able to have success along their journey? Um, First of all, I need to let you know that theater is hard work. We just make it look easy. Mm -hmm. It's very hard work. Um, What goes into memorizing lines and writing down all your directions, your, your blocking, and knowing where to stand in what light, and when the music cue comes in, you do this. It is very hard work. And if you're not willing to sacrifice some things for it, then don't get into it, number one. Do get into it if you just feel this passion that is something you want to experience. Mm -hmm. But it can be very frightening and it can be very exhilarating. Because I'm nervous every time I get ready to go on stage, honey, Mm -hmm. like this. Today, I was like, oh, Let's hurry. I was sweating and everything. <laughs> but then when I get out there, I turn that nervousness into usable energy. Yes, 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 yes. Also, be ready to deal with recognizing that you're not so doggone disciplined. Yeah. Theater is going to make you disciplined. 
Mm-hmm. One of the rules of theater is if you are 15 minutes early, you are on time. If you're on time, you're late. Mm-hmm. You have to be prompt. If the show starts at 8 and your call is at 7, be there at 645. Mm-hmm. That's just professional. Right. That's just professional. Um, if, it's, if, if you're instructed not to eat in your costume. Because maybe the costumer can't come today and wash those clothes for tomorrow's show. Don't eat in your costume. Right. Don't smoke in your costume and get a cigarette hole in it. Mm-hmm. You know, and these are things you learn along the way. Um, because I had to learn the hard way. I, but I had those. I was fortunate, man. I had those seasoned actors saying, girl, what are you doing? Come mm-hmm. over here. Like I was a little kid. And I wanted it so bad. I did whatever they said. Now, there was some that gave some advice that I didn't use at all. Mm-hmm. But I already knew that wasn't good, you know, because actors are people. Mm-hmm. We just don't judge people because we know everybody is people. Right. So follow your dreams. I don't care what they are. If you think that you want to be a painter, I never knew. I mean, I sketched a little when I was a kid. But when my business partner, Connie Blair, my sister, got cancer, I started painting because I was angry and I had to do something to get, I hate cancer, get it off me. Mm-hmm. And uh, my first painting was Cancer Burning Up and it's been in four exhibits in Tallahassee. Nice. And nice. I just painted it five years ago, six years ago. Right. Nice. When I started painting. <laughs> so do it. Whatever it is you want to do, then I don't want to be like. Right. That, but hey, they get it. I don't hear they get it. <laughs> It's the culture. <laughs> Whatever it is you want to do, pursue right. it. Have faith in yourself. Don't put yourself down if you mess up because it's not a mistake. It's not a failure. It's a lesson. Mm-hmm. And everything else is a blessing. Yes. Yes. Uh, one of the questions in the comments, because I'm not sure, but are there any theaters back open? Are theaters opening back up anytime soon? Or, or are productions being had over a virtual? I think I I watched the play uh, last weekend, Caramel play last week online. It was great. Okay. Uh, but it's going to be hard to keep that up mm-hmm. because theater is interactive. Theater is it's live theater. It's it's live. It's there. It's you can't make it live on Zoom to me. Right. Right. I mean, this was very well done. What they actually did was videotape it live. Right. Which is great. You know that I, I, but I I I hope, I hope and I have faith that um COVID-19 is going to settle. I don't think it's going to go away. I think it'll always be in the atmosphere. But people are learning how to take better care of themselves, keep their immune systems up. And so it it taught lots of lessons, too. My heart hurts the most for people who have passed on. I've lost relatives. I have Mm -hmm. relatives now who are in ICU. Um, So... Life is short, man. You can't play with it. Do what it is you want to do and don't sit out to hurt nobody. Yep. I sound like my mother. Oh, my God. I sound just like my mother. Hey, good wisdom. Good, good wisdom. So people want to support you. People want to see any past work, be a, be a part of any new work, anything that you've put out. How can people contact you? What's the best way for people to be able to support you? All right. Uh, I do have a book. And I don't have it with me in my hand. <laughs> and I'm not going to get up and go get it right now. Um, but it's called Seed for My Wheat Field. And I had it on Amazon. But, man, they want too much for my writing. So I kind of okay. took it off of there. Oh, so what I Yeah, what I do now is pre-order. And you can get me on Facebook. I'm Renee Matthews Jackson there. You can get me on Instagram. I'm a mother rapper just uh, type in mother rapper and keep the word together and I'll come up and I'm the same on, I think I'm poetry alley. I, I'm all over the place. So I'm poetry alley <laughs> on Twitter. Um, and, um, 
I'm the studio on West Georgia Street at gmail.com, but there's a trick to that. It's spelled T H E S T U D I O O N W Georgia S T at gmail.com. Okay. 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 Look, and we're gonna um gonna make sure we put that in the in the description so everything is in the description so people can okay go uh follow you and learn more about you. And look, I feel blessed. I got a chance to sit down with Mother Rapper and she spit <laughs> two rhymes for me. Look here. <laughs> this how you this how you close out Black History Month, okay? Yeah, this is yes. how you close out Black History Month. It's yes. been a, it's been a great one for me. I I was had a chance to open it up. I'm a part of the advisory board of the Black History Alliance here in Tallahassee, and we opened it up February first with our opening festival and being able to celebrate Black History, uh, celebrate the children who who were the victors in the essay contest, and just okay. different things that we have going on. A host of different events that were dedicated to Black History. I got a chance to interview my one of my favorite historians, um, Dr. Renoko Rashidi. So I got a chance to interview him. So I'm excited about that. Um, I want y'all to make sure y'all go back and watch that interview. Um, watch this interview. Share it with everybody you know. Tell them Renee Matthew Jackson. She came in. She just laid it out. Some good <laughs> information about Black Data. Um, I also got a chance to interview the great great grandniece of Annie Malone, um, who created the black hacker industry, Sasha Sasha Turnbull. I got a chance to interview her, so y'all make sure you all check that out. I'm releasing that on Wednesday, so get back to the channel and check that out on Wednesday. But this is how you end Black History Month with a great discussion about black history, black theater with a great black woman. And I appreciate everything that you've done, all the information that you've given us, the energy, the just this this whole interview was fun. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I'm sitting there looking at the time like it felt like it only been like 15 minutes. Oh but, my gosh, what does that say? One minute like, and 21. I mean yeah, one hour. hour. Yeah hour 21. And it don't feel like it though. So no it doesn't yeah. it, it really felt well. I appreciate you having no, me. No problem. Um all all much love and respect to you. Yes ma'am thank um, you um and uh stay safe and, and yes, just stay stay in the light brother I appreciate it. I appreciate it. And this is this that's the first. We're definitely gonna have you back. I wanna wanna make sure I bring you back with the gentlemen so we can all talk together. Oh my gosh. I I won't get a word in with those guys. <laughs> We're gonna fight it. We're gonna fight it. All right. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Bless. Thank you. And I see everybody next time. Peace out.